Seated. You know, I, I forget to, to introduce our new band named Dan. That's awesome. Praise God. Oh, oh. 
our Savior died, the Lord of life, can be contained. Our God has risen from the grave. Our God has risen from the grave. Behold. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hand. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise, endless hallelujah to your holy name. You will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. When the end of death is done, we'll see your face bright as the sun. We bow before. The King of Kings, oh God, forever we will sing. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hand. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hand. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing your praise. Hallelujah to your holy name. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. You reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Bye. 
blood in the bread, this blood the wine, broken for all us, all for love. The whole earth trembled, the veil was torn. Blood so amazing, blood so amazing. Would you all stand? Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners. Ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All the glory. Name above all. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Yes, Lord. Emmanuel. The rescue for sinners. The ransom from hell. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Yes, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, it's good to see you guys. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we, that was almost like we rehearsed it. That was good. Uh, you guys are funny. That's, that's good. Oh, boy. Well, I hope you're planning on staying for tacos later today. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to that. And so it's, it's going to be a great day. And the weather cooled off, right? So we could sit out in the cool. It'll be nice. Uh, let's pray. Why don't we just pray and ask that God would bless our time. Lord, we come to you this morning, and we just we want to invite you into this place, Lord. You, we, we read in Scripture that you've promised us that where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you will be amongst them. And so we are here, Lord, and we are gathered in your name. And so we're reminded that your promise is true. And so we thank you that you're blessing us this morning with your presence. And I just pray that you would speak to us today, that you would encourage us, that you would embolden us, um, and that you would speak to us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Chippy, the parakeet, never saw it coming. You guys are already laughing. That's funny. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. What, one second, he was peacefully perched in his cage. The next, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problem began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She... <laughs> She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it into the cage. The phone rang, and she turned to pick up the phone, and she'd barely said hello when, swoop, Chippy was sucked in. 
the bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, and opened the bag. Luckily, it was one of those bagged ones. Otherwise, he would have been like, whoo, 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 you know. And there was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. And since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she quickly grabbed him and she raced to the bathroom. She turned on the faucet. She held Chippy under the running water. Then realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird odor would do. She reached for the hairdryer. And then she blasted Chippy with her hairdryer with hot air. Poor Chippy. You know, he never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma... Chippy's owner was asked how he was recovering, and she replied, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. (laughs) Oh, man. It's hard to see why getting sucked in, washed up, and blown over would result in any other thing, right? That's enough to steal the song out of anybody's heart. Listen, I'm wondering if you've ever felt that way. I mean, have you ever felt, you know, sucked in, washed up, and blown over? I mean, have you ever felt like everything's closing in on you, that nothing can go right, that maybe you're experiencing, you know, some financial difficulties? Maybe you've had some family members that are sort of off in left field, or maybe your children are, are a hot mess, Maybe your neighbors are driving you crazy. Maybe your boss is driving you crazy. Or maybe your health is presenting you with some constant challenges. And no matter what you do, things don't seem to be getting better. And I want to talk to you this morning. We're going to start a subject today that will begin today and continue in a few weeks. But but I want to talk to you this morning about this idea of fighting wise. And this idea of spiritual warfare. You see, I think it's time for us to recognize that there is a puppeteer. That there's someone behind the curtain that's pulling the strings. And that we need to move from being sort of on the defense to the offense. And I I have such a sense in my spirit that we are at such a critical time in the life of the church that we need to wake up and recognize that we are at war. And we've been on the subject of, of wisdom, and we've been exploring through the book of Ephesians how Paul has given us all of these principles on how we're to live our lives. And we're finally coming to the end of that as Paul sort of wraps it all together and says, listen... I need to remind you that as you're living wise and as you're engaging in this way, that you are in the midst of a battle. And the battle is not always what you think it is. It's not always what's right in front of you. And many times we're fighting things that really are not what we should be fighting. I want you to do a couple things for me this morning. One, we're, we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 6 here, beginning in verse 10. So if you have your Bibles, open that up to Ephesians 6. But I also want you to open your Bibles and put your finger in Daniel chapter 10. We're, we're going to be reading out of Daniel chapter 10 here in a little bit. So you can just kind of put a piece of paper there or your, or your bookmark. Or if you have an app, super easy. You can just quickly go there when we're there. But we're going to begin reading here in Ephesians chapter 10 as Paul talks about the idea of engaging in a spiritual battle, okay? And so here we are. So let's read this together. This is Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Paul says this. He says, finally, and by the way, this finally comes after all the instruction he's given us on how we're to live our lives. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. 
Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, Paul says, that whenever I speak, words may be given to me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. There was a little boy who was spending his Saturday morning playing in his sandbox, and he had with him his box of cars and his trucks and his plastic pail and a shiny little red plastic shovel. And in the process of creating roads and tunnels in the soft sand, he discovered in the sandbox was this really large rock. And the boy began to dig around the rock, and he began to tug at it. He managed to dislodge it, and, and with a little bit of struggle and, and with some force, he, he be, slowly pushed it and nudged the rock over to the edge of the sandbox by the, the sides. And when he got to the edge, he found that he couldn't roll it up over the little wall of the sandbox, and he was really struggling. And he was fighting with this rock and struggling, and he was determined, and he was pushing, and he was pulling, and he was getting in and out of the box, and every time he'd get the rock up to the edge of that sandbox, it would fall back down in. And this went on for quite a while, and he struggled. And, and, and finally, he burst into tears. And all this time, the boy's father was watching him from inside the house, from in the living room. And at the moment that the tears began to fall, a large shadow fell across that boy in the sandbox, and it was his father. And gently but firmly, he said, son, why didn't you use all the strength that you had available? Defeated, the boy saw back, I did, dad. I did. I used all the strength that I had. No, he says, no, you didn't. You didn't use all the strength you had. You didn't ask me. And with that, the father reached down. He picked up the rock. He removed it from the sandbox. Listen, that is a word picture that really describes what Paul is telling us here. He's telling us, if we read there again in verse 10, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on, he says, the full armor of God so that, you can take, uh, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Listen, the first point that I want to make with you this morning is simply this. We're not strong enough by ourselves to defeat the forces of darkness. And, and I want to say this, that if you try to defeat the forces of darkness, if you try to take the devil on by yourself, You're going to find yourself living literally in hell. Your life will become a mess. Because you cannot defeat the devil by yourself. And it's one of the reasons why Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So we're not strong enough by ourselves to defeat the forces of darkness. And the victorious strength that we need to defeat the devil only comes from God. It comes from God. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, and I want to read this because when we start to think about this idea of being strong in the Lord and in His mighty power, by the way, I underlined this, mighty power, because God's power is mighty. I mean, it is tremendous. And it's there For us to access, we can call upon God and He says that He will come to us. And so I want to read this out of Colossians chapter 1. Paul is describing sort of the power of God here. And he says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, he says, The Son, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created. Things in heaven 
and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And listen to this. This is fascinating. And he is before all things, the Bible says. And in him, all things hold together. Listen, I was, I was thinking about this idea of the mighty power of God. The Bible tells us that in Jesus, in him, all things hold together. Did you know that physicists have discovered that there are four known forces in the universe? There's four known forces in the universe. There's gravity, which by the way, gravity is one of the weakest forces. But gravity holds our entire solar system in place and together. And it's fine-tuned. And it's perfect. If gravity had, had a different uh, a numerical value to it, a different force, our solar system as we know it would not exist. Planets would collide. Stars would collide with stars etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's four forces in the universe. Gravity, there's the electromagnetic force. There's what's called the strong nuclear force, and there's the weak nuclear force. And scientists have, have observed these forces. In fact, we've tried to manipulate some of these forces. It's how we have developed what we call nuclear weapons. And so nuclear weapons are an example of mankind fooling with these strong forces. I read a quote by a guy named Bill Raines as he talks about this idea of the nuclear force, which, by the way, I think that is what Paul is describing there in Colossians, where he says that in him all things are held together. And so Raines says this, he says, man has discovered a force that holds the universe together, and we've called it the strong nuclear force. Man has a theory of how it works and tries to explain what holds an atom together. Scientists can't and don't explain how the perfect balance of the strong nuclear force was created in the first place. They observe atoms through experiments and speculate on the strong nuclear force. They equate the strong nuclear force to glue. That's the best they can do. How God holds atoms together is something only God knows Because Jesus created the universe and the Bible tells us that he holds it all together. Scientists will keep speculating and observing the strong nuclear force with amazement. He says, I'll keep observing the fine-tuned universe of God's creation with amazement. Knowing that Jesus created all things and holds everything together by the power of his word. You see, when we talk about the idea of God's mighty power, we need to understand that it is actually mighty. I mean, it is tremendously strong and powerful. God has vast reservoirs of might that can be realized as power in our Christian life. But here's the key. The power is available, but we have to plug into it. Has anybody ever bought a refrigerator, put it in your house, put all the food in, and just didn't plug it in? I mean, how good would that be? You, you'd have a mess. You've got to get plugged into the power source in order for, for you to work and to experience victory in your life. And so this quote is so true. God has vast reservoirs of might that can be realized as power in our Christian life, but his might does not work in me as I sit passively. His might works in me as I rely on it and step out to do the work. I've asked a good friend of mine, Paul Mitchell, to come up and to share a a little story uh, that he shared with me some years ago. Um, I've known Paul for quite a number of years now. He's one of my best friends. And uh, Paul has an amazing life. He's going to just give you a brief little synopsis and then tell you a little story here. So, Paul, welcome. Thanks. Uh, So, good morning. So I'm a physician assistant. I work in the Valley here, and I've been doing it uh, for quite some time. Um, To back up a little bit, I've been practicing medicine um, for about 34 years. Uh, I was a, uh, I worked in a volunteer rescue house in my hometown 
when I was 16 years old. I joined the military, became a combat medic, and then retired from the military and then decided to become a physician assistant. I love medicine. And in 34 years of practicing medicine, you, you think you've seen it all, but you really haven't when a little girl walks into your office and with an earache. And you go, well, I've treated, I've have treated about a thousand patients with, with earaches, and so I didn't really think much of it. I bring her in the office. I said, what's going on? And she says, well, I have this pain in my ear, and a little crackling noise. And I said, how long have you had this for? And she says, oh, approximately five days. I said, well, let's take a look. So she sits on the table, and, and I always look in the good ear for a reference to see. You know, if there's something that the good ear and the bad ear shows me differently. And I look in the good ear, and it was good. And I look in the bad ear, and I took a step backwards, and I said, well, let me look again. And I look again in that ear, and, and believe me, I've seen all kinds of things in kids' ears, from jelly beans and erasers and all kinds of stuff. Well, I look in the ear, and I say, um, you've had this for five, five days now? And she goes, yeah. And a cockroach had taken up residence in this little girl's ear, right? That was my face. Everybody's going like, exactly my reaction. (laughs) Well, we were able to get this bug out of this little girl's ear. And when she left the office, her symptoms had subsided completely. And so, and I just want you to know that not all the time that we have symptoms of something and we realize we're, you know, symptoms tell us we're sick or symptoms tell us something wrong. But sometimes we don't get those symptoms. Like, for example, blood pressure, right? Blood pressure is what we in the medical field call silent killer. People don't know they have hypertension until there's something wrong. Luckily, this girl had something wrong. We were able to remove it and now she's better. Do you see, stay up here for a second. How many patients do you typically see in a day, Paul? So typically right now I see about 45 to 50 patients a day. I see uh, last month um, I saw 986 patients last month. So um, if you have a chance after the service today, shake Paul's hand. (laughs) He's, uh, He's a busy guy and he's doing some amazing work. Thank you, Paul. I asked Paul to share because I, I want to use his story. I, that story, by the way, he told me that years ago. That, that was amazing. It grossed me out. I'm like, and I called him last night and I said, I've been thinking about this, Paul. You got to come and tell that story today. That story is crazy. Like, what in the world? Anyways, but, but here's the thing. The Bible tells us that, we have, that there are symptoms. There are symptoms all around us. And we see them. And I described some of those to you when we first started here. You know, maybe your kids are a hot mess. Maybe your family's a mess. Maybe you're having financial difficulties. Maybe your health is a mess. Maybe our country's spiraling out of control. Okay? There's symptoms all around us. Maybe we're seeing the decline of Christianity in our culture. There are symptoms all around us. And oftentimes people think that the symptom is the problem. And we try to fix the problem by addressing the symptom. And that's the wrong approach, by the way. And Paul's telling us here that, look, there are symptoms everywhere. Everywhere. But the real problem is not necessarily what you see with your eyes. The real problem is not necessarily what's right in front of you. And so the real problem, as Paul describes it this way in verse 12, listen to what he says. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood, by the way, includes everything you can see and touch. Everything. Everything you can see and touch. He says, your struggle, our struggle, is not against everything you can see and touch. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have an enemy, the Bible says. 
and he's invisible. And he's working, and he's conniving, and he's planning, and he's doing all of these things, and the effects of that work are playing themselves out physically in our lives. We see them. We see people depressed. We see people down. We see people struggling. We struggle ourselves. And this struggle is real. It's happening. But sometimes we forget that we're engaged in a battle that we cannot see. That we have an enemy that is invisible. And he has a name. And his name is Lucifer. His name is the devil. Listen, there's a big difference between the symptoms and the disease. And it's time for us to wise up, to start fighting wise, and start addressing the disease instead of the symptom. And the disease is that simply that we are engaged in a spiritual battle. Our fight's not against mankind. Our problem is not a human problem. It's a spiritual problem. And I cannot fight this battle with physical weapons. Uh, It's not a matter of self-control. It's not a matter of trying harder or seeing if I can discipline myself more. You see, the battle is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. M.L. Jones says this, he's quoted as saying this, he says, this is one of the most glorious things about the Christian faith. He says, you can't reason yourself into it, but the moment you're in it, you find that it is the most reasonable thing in the world. I love this quote because he describes Christianity from the outside looking in, saying people think that Christianity is foolish from the outside looking in. But once you get on the inside and you look out, you realize that it's the most reasonable thing in the world. And once we discover and learn that we're engaged in a spiritual battle and we address the challenges and the problems in our lives in that way, then we will discover that this is a reasonable thing and that we are doing the things that we should be, that we're engaging in the battle in the way that we should, and we will find that we become victorious. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says this in verse 3, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power to demolish strongholds. And he says again in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, he says this, When when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of your sins, having canceled the charge of your legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed. And here we see these words again, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. By the way, Paul describes these things in Ephesians in this way, and he gives us a description of what these these, the enemy is. He says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And as you hear and read the description that Paul gives, we get a sense that there is an army that exists, and the army is ordered. He's describing an order that exists within the army. And you might even consider that it may be in relationship to ranks, if you will. Maybe he's describing the ranks of the troops that the devil has employed. And so he describes them in this way. And and we see other descriptions of them as powers and of authorities and of rulers. And so we we get an idea that the devil has an army and that he has privates, corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, you know, all the way up to generals. And there is a battle that is taking place that many people are unaware of. I want to read to you a little excerpt out of the book of Daniel because Daniel gives us a picture of this battle. And by the way, I believe that the battle is waging 
right now. As we speak, it never ceases, it's continuing, and the devil is taking ground, and God's forces are pushing back. And by the way, God has called us as the church to put on the armor and to stand and to not back off. And so in Daniel chapter 10, let's read this together. Daniel has been given a dream, by the way, and we we see lots of dreams in Daniel here. And these are dreams, as Daniel describes, about sort of the last days, okay? And you've heard me say this before, but I really believe that we're living in the last days. We're seeing prophecies of the Scriptures fulfilled in our lifetime. I mean, it's a tremendous privilege to be alive right now. What an exciting time to be alive that we're witnessing the prophecies of God fulfilled in our lifetime. And Daniel has dreams about these end times, and he writes about them. And so in Daniel chapter 10, he records one of these instances of a dream he has and how he spent some time trying to understand the interpretation of the dream. And so it says in Daniel chapter 10, and I'm just going to begin reading in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. And at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for for three weeks. So here we see Daniel has a dream, this vision, and now he's spent three weeks in mourning. He's depressed. I ate no choice food. No meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. By the way, have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever felt down? I mean, where you're not, you don't want to eat. You're not, you know, taking care of yourself the way you should. Daniel's describing depression. And then he says in verse 4, On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. And he says, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it. But such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words that I'm about to speak to you and stand up. Hang on a second. Where did we just see that? Paul says to us, we need to put on the full armor of God and stand. And when we've stood, we need to stand some more. He says, I'm speaking to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. And and when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Verse 12, then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since, and I want you to get this, this is is the point of this story that I'm trying to make today. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. When did God hear his prayer? The moment he prayed it. The moment the words left his mouth, God heard it, and he sent a response immediately. Listen what happens. He says, I've come in response to them, verse 13, but, and here's the devil, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me. For 21 days. Then Michael, which by the way, we know Michael is a warring angel. 
probably the highest general in God's army. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. By the way, the king of Persia, this prince, as Daniel des- is, or the, as the angel is describing him, is the devil himself. The devil intercepted the response of Daniel's prayer, and a war took place, and a tremendous battle. And that messenger from God was engaged in that battle, he says, for 21 days. I fought with, this, with the devil himself for 21 days until Michael came. God said, all right, we need to send some reinforcements. And the reinforcements came, freed him up to come and deliver the message to Daniel. And so he says in verse 14, now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For the vision concerns a time yet to come. Listen, there is a real battle and war that is waging. We cannot see it. Sometimes God's responses to us may seem delayed. And sometimes the delay is because of God's sovereign will in your life. Sometimes the delay is as a result of the devil intervening and God engaging in this battle against the devil himself. And I have to be honest with you, I don't understand all of the nuances of that because I know that God is all-powerful and almighty. And I know the Bible tells us this, that God is sort of restraining himself because he does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. And so God is exercising some restraint today as he allows the devil to continue to wage war against him and his angels and against his church and his people. And so there is a battle that is taking place. And Daniel was in the middle of that battle. And he became depressed for several weeks. Is it possible that depression could be a result of a spiritual issue? Yes. We see it right here in Scripture. And so the messenger was freed, came to Daniel to minister to him, to lift his spirits, told him to stand. Listen, there's a war waging, and we're called to fight wise. We're called to fight wise and to stand fast. So Paul says there again in Ephesians 6, verse 13, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, stand. And then he says again in verse 14, and stand. I mean, how many times does he have to say stand for us to say, wait a minute, I think maybe we should stand. (laughs) And here's the deal, look. This is not just a getting up, but this is a standing with force. He's calling us to put on the paraphernalia of war. To equip ourselves and to be ready and to stand and to stand fast. Which means hold your ground and press forward. There is a tremendous pressure in our world today to try to get us as Christians to back off. We had a global pandemic that said, don't go to church. Which, by the way, if you believe Paul's words, is part of the spiritual battle. For we don't wage our war against flesh and blood. And there is a a tremendous pressure in the world today for Christians to simply lay down, to give up, to back off. And it's a real and it's a palpable pressure. I mean, it is there. And we are feeling it. And we have a choice to respond. We can respond by either saying, okay, we're going to lay down. Or we can equip ourselves. And we can stand fast. And push ourselves into the enemy and hold our ground and take back ground and be warriors. I want to close by telling you a story. This is a true story. It came out of a horrible 
tragedy that took place in 1989 in, Ar in Armenia. In 1989, there was a, a huge earthquake in Armenia. And, and within four minutes, this earthquake had flattened almost the entire nation and killed over 30,000 people. And moments after the deadly tremor ceased, a father raced to an elementary school to save his son. When he arrived, he saw that the building had been leveled. And looking at the mass of stones and rubble, he remembered a promise that he made to his son. No matter what happens, I'll always be there for you. Driven by his own promise, he found the area closest to his son's room and he began to pull back the rocks and the rubble. Other parents showed up at the scene. They were sobbing. It's too late, they told him. You know, you, you know they're already dead. You can't help them. And even a police officer who stopped by told him, Stop, sir, you're, you're wasting your time. There's no hope here. But the father refused. And for eight hours, he removed rubble. And the eight hours turned into 16. The 16 turned into 32. And he relentlessly, for 36 hours, dug by himself through the rubble of that elementary school. Finally, after 38 hours of exhausting work, his hands bloodied, he heard a voice. He called his boy's name, Armin. Armin. And a voice answered him, Dad, it's me. The boy added these priceless words. I told the other kids not to worry. I told them that if you were alive, that you'd save me. And because of that, you would save them. He says, because you promised that no matter what, I'll always be there for you. Listen, we're engaged in a battle. Jesus, when he left the earth and ascended back into the throne room of God, he left us with these words. I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I will always be with you, even to the very end of the age. We have a father in heaven who has promised to never give up to always be with us. And no matter what challenges and difficulties we're facing, we can tap into His mighty power. And He is there for us. And we can be victorious. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank You so much for this day. I thank You for the promises of Your Word. And I pray for us, Lord, as we engage in this great battle. As we sense and feel in our spirits that that we're nearing the end of times. As, even as Daniel says, these are about the things related to the end of times and times yet to come. I really believe we're living in those times today. And what a privilege, Lord, that you have chosen us, that we find ourselves in this place. What an exciting time to be alive. And so, Lord, I ask that you would give us the courage to equip ourselves for this great battle and that we would stand and stand fast and resist the attacks of the enemy. And I pray for those, Lord, who are here or who are listening today that are really struggling, and maybe that's you. Maybe you're saying, listen, I'm feeling the full weight of this battle in my life, and it's, it's more than I can bear. And if that's you, I want, to, I want to invite you right now today to cast your burdens upon Jesus. He has told us, listen, if you're carrying a heavy load, give it to me. Give it to me, I'll carry it for you. I'll lighten your load. And so I want to give you an opportunity right now to say, Lord, I desperately need you in my life. And I can't bear this weight anymore, and I'm going to give it to you. If that's you, and you're desperately needing Jesus in your life today, I want to invite you to, to make a decision to tell him today that you trust him with your life and that you want to give your life to him. If you've never done that before, 
if you've never made that decision, if you've been walking this life by yourself and the weight is more than you can bear, I want to invite you right now to give your life to Jesus. And I want to invite you to stand. Jesus says, listen, if you're ashamed to proclaim my name before the Father, I'll be ashamed to proclaim your name before the Father. This is a time for choosing. It's a time for you to say, I'm all in. I'm giving my life to Jesus. If that's you, I want to invite you to stand. Just right where you are. Maybe you're listening online. If you are, stand if you can. Or lift your hand up and say, listen, that's me. That's me. Lord, I pray for those who are making this decision. I pray that you would just bless them today. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you just to say a simple prayer, just to say, Lord, I desperately need you in my life. The weight of all of these things is more than I can bear. And I'm asking that you would please forgive me. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. And so maybe your prayer today is, Lord, forgive me. And then invite him to come into your life. Invite him to take this load you're carrying and to lighten it. Tell him that you love him. Give him your life today. I've heard someone say that those who lose their lives in Christ will find themselves or find their lives for the very first time. And so maybe today's the day. And Lord, I pray for all of us this morning that you would just equip us, embolden us, and give us the courage, and give us the eyes to see the real battle that's taking place. That we might not be discouraged by the things we see, but that we might be able to engage in the appropriate ways and stand fast and fight wise. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being such a good and loving God. May we please you with the things we say and do today. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.